We thank you because you're not our adversary, but our friend. You're not our tormentor, but our healer and physician. You're not our destroyer, but our redeemer. Father, if and when we're subjected to suffering, the cause of which we're unable to understand, may we never harbor doubts regarding your existence and your benevolence, but remain firmly clinging to our faith until the night of suffering is swept away by the dawn of a new hope and a new day. Be with us, Father, as we go through this chapter, chapter 20 of Revelation. Help us to understand the message that you have in store for us. May we encounter our hardships in this life as valiant soldiers and not allow them to crush us nor defeat us, but give us fortitude, endurance, and ennoble our character. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're on chapter 20 of Revelation. This is a tough chapter. <laughs> I have uh, prepared four page notes on it. My notes are four pages. And I have an addendum about the thousand years. Um, oh, we went. You're, you're screen sharing. I'm screen sharing. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Okay. I will start reading with uh, verse one. And I saw, remember, the speaker is the Apostle John, and he is describing to us what he saw in vision. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, bound him for a thousand years. Uh, let's stop here. <laughs> An anonymous angel with a chain in his hand restrains the devil. Uh, this is a dramatic declaration that shows that Satan is no match for God. Satan is not God's equal. Uh, an angel subdues this uh, devil, subdues the devil and restrains him. In other words, uh, puts an end to his influence on this earth. Uh, this ha hasn't happened yet, we know, but it will take place in the future. And then let's see verse three. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Now, here we have elaborate language that the devil was thrown into an abyss or a bottomless pit, and he was, uh, and God put a seal upon it. So the devil could not never get out of his prison. Uh, all this elaborate language indicates that uh, the activities of the devil will not only be curbed by God, but they will come to a complete cessation. God will put an end to the devil's activities on this earth. He will not only curb his activities, but he will completely disable him. Okay, and the devil will remain chained, restrained. Remember, chained means restrained. Uh, the language here is symbolic. The whole book of Revelation is written in symbolic language. So the chain is a symbol of restraining. The devil is chained. By that we understand God has restrained him. He doesn't have the freedom uh, that he had before. He won't have the freedom he had before. And this won't be his punishment yet. His punishment will come at the end of the chapter. This imprisonment or restraining, it's just um, 
a temporary thing until he gets his full punishment, which will come to it in uh, at the end of the chapter. Now, I know some Christians, I've met some Christians who think they can restrain the devil with their prayer. They pray and say, Lord, I command you, restrain the devil. <laughs> uh, the devil will not be restrained by a, a prayer offered by a human being. The devil will be restrained by God. The devil is chained and imprisoned not by human effort, but by divine action. So no human, no human being can restrain the devil. God will do that. And the mode of the devil's mode of operation is disclosed. He, he is a deceiver, and therefore the most effective weapon against him would be the truth of God's word. The Bible is a two-edged sword and is the best defense for the Christian. When tempted, use the Bible. Use the word of God as your offensive weapon, as your sword. And the Bible is called the sword of the spirit anyway. So, <clears throat> and the sword is good for defensive warfare and offensive warfare. It's good for all types of warfare. And remember that the sword represents the word of God. And the devil being a master deceiver, he uses many dis disguises. He appears like an angel of light. He can disguise himself. <laughs> he doesn't look like a ugly person with horns and a pitchfork in his hand to frighten people. No, he appears to them like an angel of light. And you know, falsehood is repulsive. The devil uses falsehood in an attractive way. How? Because he's a master of disguise. He camouflages falsehood in such a way that makes it, he sugarcoats it and makes it appear as something good, something appealing. So that people cannot differentiate between the right and wrong if they are not well founded in the word of God. Okay, we know the devil is not restrained now because in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we're told our adversary, the devil, is roaming around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. So picture the devil as a hungry lion roaming around trying to find a weak soul that he may devour him or her. So the devil at this time is a is a devouring lion seeking a prey. So he's not been restrained yet. Now, when it comes to the thousand years, um, I happen there, I know there are some people who believe this, these 1000 years are literal years. Others believe the thousand years are symbolic, used figuratively. And uh, the argument for the thousand years being symbolic is quite strong. Let me mention some. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we're told that Christ will reign, that the, king, the the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and he will reign forever and ever. So the reign of Christ is not restricted to 1000 years. Christ will reign forever and ever. And there are 19 verses in the New Testament that refer to the uh, reign of Christ being forever and ever. 1000 years is not forever. <laughs> okay. And uh, another thing, Psalm, Psalm 50 verse 10. In Psalm 50, verse 10, we're told that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. I'm sure you've, you know this verse. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. This verse has been used by platform chairmen when they make an appeal for the offering. They say, all we have belongs to God. So whatever gift we give to God is uh, we are returning to him what he has given us. <laughs> 
well, if the, if the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God, does this mean that the cattle on the thousand and one hill does not belong to God? Of course not. The meaning of this verse is that God owns everything. The thousand hills is not literal, it's symbolic. It means God owns everything. Everything in, the, in this universe belongs to God. Not just the cattle on a thousand hill, but the cattle on two thousand hills and five thousand hills and so forth. Then in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 15, uh, God tells the Israelites, or Moses tells the Israelites, be mindful of his covenant, of God's covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. The old covenant was given, we're told, to thousands of generations, meaning to many generations. Here, thousand generations means many generations. Or in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4, Solomon offered burnt offerings, sacrifices to God, and he says, Solomon offered thousand, one thousand burnt offerings on the altar of Gibeon. Nobody counted the offerings, which uh, animal offerings Solomon offered on the altar. So here, a thousand burnt offerings means uh, many, many. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 19, the apostle Paul says, it's better for me to speak five words and be understood than speaking thousands of words in an unknown tongue. He's trying to curb those people who were talking in tongues in, in Corinth, in the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth was the most problematic church during the, the lifetime of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and he tries to correct their, one of their wrong practices. He tells them, thank God I know more languages than you do. But it's better to speak five words and be understood than speak 10,000 words in an unintelligible language, in an unknown tongue. By the way, the word tongue, uh, the yeah. Greek for tongue is glossalia, which means a known spoken language. It doesn't mean gibberish. It doesn't mean an unknown language. It doesn't mean the language of angels. It means it's a known uh, glossalia. The literal meaning of glossalia is a known spoken language. And when the apostles spoke in tongues, the people who listened to them understood their message and responded to their message. They said in Acts chapter 2, what shall we do? And Peter told them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall uh, receive um, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, when the apostles spoke in tongues, their listeners understood what they were saying and they responded. Okay, so the word 1000 uh, is used in the Bible in a symbolic way, not in a literal way. And I happen to believe that here in Revelation 20, since the context is symbolic, you have a chain, you have an abyss, uh, you have... Uh, a seal, uh, all these are symbols. So the whole context is symbolic, not literal. By the way, how is the devil chained? <laughs> By circumstances. I believe God will bring about circumstances of such nature that would make it impossible for the devil to operate and deceive people anymore. So th the chain, as I said, is a symbol of restraint and the devil is restrained, not by a physical chain, but by the chain of circumstances. God will bring about a chain of circumstances that would make it impossible for the devil to continue operating. Okay, now these 1000 years are called millennium. The word millennium is from the Latin language. Mille means a million in Latin, and an annum comes from the word Latin word for year. 
um, Anna or Anus. Okay. Now regarding the, the the millennium, the word millennium is not used in the Bible. If you if you consult a Bible dictionary or a Bible encyclopedia, you won't find the word millennium there. Millennium is not used in the Bible. One thousand years is mentioned only once, and only in Revelation chapter twenty, verses three and four. This is the only place where 1,000 years, the millennium, is mentioned. By the way, 1,000 years equal is a millennium. It's like the Trinity, some people, the Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. Correct. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but there is ample evidence for the existence of the Trinity in the Bible. Like Jesus gave the baptism formula for his apostles, they were to baptize their converts, them of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have to baptize people in the name of the Triune God. Then the apostolic benediction. What was the apostolic benediction? May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So all three are mentioned: the God, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So. Even though the Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, there is ample evidence for it. And the way millennium is not mentioned in the Bible, but 1,000 years is mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. Now, if you study church history, as I have done, you'll find that there are three approaches to the millennium. And these three approaches are different systems of theology that deal with eschatology. Now, the word eschatology means the study of last day events. It comes from the Greek eschatos, which means last day, last days. So the study of the last day events is called eschatology. Uh, and uh, there are three approaches to the millennium, as I said. One, the first one is called amillennialism. You have the word millennium and put A in front of it. Amillennialism means no millennium. <laughs> uh, this is a misnomer. The people who advocate this approach, they say that they, they believe that the 1,000 years are not are symbolic they're not literal that's the only point i agree with them <laughs> i don't agree with the rest of what they say i only believe that the thousand years are sim are symbolic not literal that's the only thing i agree with them so and they say the millennial rule of christ began with his first advent and extends until the second advent they, so in their idea, the millennium started when Christ was born and it's continuing and will continue until his return to this earth. So now we are in the millennium. <laughs> because they said millennium is not literal, it's symbolic. So it, if it's symbolic, it means an indefinite period of time. And it, that's true that when 1,000 is used in reference to time in the Bible, it means an indefinite period of time. As I, uh, I referred, I cited several biblical verses to prove that point. Now, so the people who believe in amillennialism are saying the immortal souls of the believers who fell asleep in Christ, they're now in heaven reigning with Christ. And that's the millennial rule of Christ. Did you get it? It's very important that you understand what these people mean uh, by amillennial. And there are many Christians who subscribe to this viewpoint, who have adopted this theology. So the millennium is an indefinite period of time that extends between the first and the second advent of Christ. And Christ is reigning with the immortal souls of the Christian believers who are with him in heaven now. Okay, so that's the millennial rule of Christ. Christ is ruling now with 
the, with the Christian believers who are whose souls are with him in heaven. Okay, so that's a millennialism. Then there is post millennialism. That's the second approach. Post means after. The advocates of this view say that a time will come when the whole world will be Christianized. <laughs> the whole world will accept Jesus, will become Christians, and then Christ will come. And then Christ will come and establish. Uh, in other words, what they're saying is that the millennium will happen as a result of the activities of the church, as a result of the activities of the Christians. The Christians will witness to Christ, for Christ in such a strong way. The whole world will be Christianized. A state of utopia will exist. There'll be a period of peace and righteousness and prosperity unprecedented in human history. And then Christ returns, the first resurrection happens, followed by the judgment, the final judgment, and in this way, etern eternal life continues, will be continued. This is the post millennialism. Remember, post means after, meaning Christ will come after the word is Christianized or evangelized. Um, this is uh, something I can't believe, cannot accept, because uh, human effort is feeble. I don't believe that uh, a utopia will be created by human effort. <laughs> Whatever humans attempted to do has always failed. And so this is a pipe dream that uh, <laughs> we will be able to Christianize the whole world. <laughs> okay, so post-millennialism is something I, I can't agree with. Then the third view is pre-millennialism. Pre-millennialism, pre means before. Now, according to this view, all events that are happening in the world right now will lead to a crowning climax. And that climax will be the triumphant return of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ on the clouds of heaven, accompanied by all the angels and all the saved of all ages. And he will come and establish his, uh, his kingdom will be transferred from heaven to earth and it will be for an indefinite period of time. Uh, and there will be unprecedented peace and righteousness. Jesus' kingdom will be uh, a kingdom of peace and, right, and righteousness. And, uh, <clears throat> and there will be no end to his reign. So it's not uh, restricted to 1,000 years. Uh, Christ reigns forever and ever. So this is the premillennial view, and this is the view that I, <laughs> I, I have accepted for myself. Uh, it it it's, it makes the most sense, and it's the most biblical. And the the other, the first two, uh, are not very biblical uh, for me. But. Uh, and of course, when you take the pre-millennial view, there are subdivisions. I don't want to go into the subdivisions because they're too complicated. Um, when, it, when you go to the uh, subdivisions, you, you, you get lost. <laughs> because what, uh, what it is, it's a chain of human argumentations, human arguments that are too complicated for any layman to understand. So I am a pre-millennialist in that I believe that events happening today are leading toward a climax. And that climax will be the triumphant second coming of Jesus Christ. He will come in all his glory, accompanied by all the angels of heaven and the souls of all the saved. And he, he will, Restrain the devil, imprison him, 
meaning disable him first and then the first resurrection takes place followed by the uh, final judgment the second resurrection and then the etern the the reign of christ continues forever and ever from then on so that's the that's the pre millennial view that's the view i subscribe to you're free to choose whichever one you want <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Okay, verse four, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, let's stop here. So, <clears throat> the redeemed of all ages will uh, will judge. I believe will judge the fallen angels. In First Corinthians chapter six, verses two and three, the apostle Paul says, "Don't you know that we will judge the redeemed? Will judge the angels." So, according to First Corinthians chapter six, verses two and three. The redeemed will judge uh, the <clears throat> the angels, the fallen angels. <laughs> you know, the devil was able to deceive one third of the heavenly angels who followed him in rebellion, and the redeemed will judge those fallen angels, according to First Corinthians chapter six, verses two and three. Uh, <clears throat> and remember, Jesus says in the Revelation we studied before. To the overcomer, Jesus says, I'll let him sit on my throne. When we sit on the throne of Christ, we become royalty. We become judges. <laughs> We're given a privilege and authority that we didn't have before. Of course, the judge, I believe, is Jesus Christ. Because remember, after his resurrection, what did Jesus say? All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so he, Christ is the ultimate judge, but he'll let us judge the fallen angels. Um, so <clears throat> all those who have been faithful for Christ and who have died or have been martyred for uh, their loyalty to him, all of them will be rewarded. All of these people will be rewarded. And there'll be uh, the first. You see, there are actually two resurrections. Okay. Okay. According to John chapter five verse twenty-eight, John five twenty-eight, there are two resurrections, or there will be two resurrections. He says, "A time will come when they who are in the grave will hear the voice, the voice of the Son of God, and they who have done good." will be resurrected to life and those who've done evil will be resurrected uh, for damnation or condemnation so there are two resurrections and i believe these two resurrections are 1000 years apart the first resurrection takes place when christ returns and the millennium begins and then the second resurrection happens at the end of the 1000 year period and then we'll see why the second resurrection uh, is not uh, is not a good one. It's not the good resurrection. It's not the resurrection of the blessed. Uh, okay, I believe we missed one verse. Five, <laughs> My five. Verse five. Okay, verse five. I sometimes go ahead. Okay, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Yeah, I ran ahead of myself. And this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they'll be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So, remember... John 5 28 tells us that Jesus announced that there'll be two resurrections. 
And in Revelation 20, you find that these two resurrections will be 1,000 years apart. The first resurrection takes place when Christ returns. When Christ returns, the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right? Now, there is a point I want to clarify. When a Christian dies today, what happens? The soul is detached from the body or the soul is separated from the body. The body returns to dust, decomposes. It's not important anymore. But the soul goes to God. So the souls of all Christian believers, the souls of all those who fell asleep in Jesus are now in heaven reigning with Christ. At the second coming, they accompany Jesus and are given resurrection bodies. The dead in Christ shall rise first. They're given resurrection bodies. All right. Uh, so they're now spirit beings. But at the second coming of Christ, they'll receive their resurrection bodies. And this first resurrection is blessed. It's powerful because the second death will have no power on those who rise in the first resurrection. And uh, those who rise in the first resurrection will be privileged. They'll become priests of God <laughs> and will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Look verse seven. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they're like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's stop here. After 1,000 years, the devil is released. <laughs> uh, how? He was restrained and he was imprisoned, so to speak. He was uh, restrained. Now the restraint is removed. Um, as I said, he was restrained by circumstances. Because what happens when Christ comes with all his glory? We studied in Revelation chapter 6 that the wicked will not be able to stand during that day when Christ comes. They'll die from the glory of his face. They'll try to hide in, in rocks and in caves, in crevices, but they won't be able to hide from Jesus Christ. They won't be escaped from him. They'll die from his glory. You remember when Christ was raised, resurrected? the Roman soldiers fell like dead from the glory of one angel. Now remember, Jesus will come with all his angels and with the souls of all the saved of all ages. Can you imagine that glory? From that glory, according to Revelation chapter 6, the wicked uh, won't be able to stand. They'll die. So, when Christ comes and establish the millennial kingdom on this earth. The saved are with him, judging the angels. And the devil is out of commission because the wicked are dead. Those evil men who died not believing in Jesus are still in their graves because they won't rise until the second resurrection which is 1,000 years later. And those who remained alive until the coming of Christ will die from the glory of his, uh, from his glory. And so he has no followers. He has no people to work with. In that, in that sense, he is in prison. But at the end of the 1,000 years, the second resurrection takes place. The wicked come out with their resurrection bodies. And the devil manages to deceive them one more time. This does away with the notion of a second chance. You see, there's no second chance. The, the wicked who are resurrected, the rest of the dead, 
meaning those who, are, who, those who did not rise in the first resurrection. Uh, when they are given resurrection bodies, the devil manages to rally them around him and leads them in an assault on the camp of the saints and tries to capture the headquarters of uh, the kingdom of Christ, which is the beloved city. The beloved city is Jerusalem. And then what happens? Fire comes from heaven, devours them. This is not the last battle because this battle ends before it begins. As soon as the devil rallies his troops and attempts to uh, attack the camp of the saints, fire comes down from God, devours them. Uh, so this is not Armageddon. We studied Armageddon earlier. Uh, this battle ends before it begins. Uh, Christ uh, immediately puts an end to it. And, and then what happens, verse 10, the devil uh, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the burning sulfur, the lake of burning sulfur, that's hell, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown earlier. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So <clears throat> the devil's uh, strategy doesn't work, it fails. Um, and he is thrown, eventually he's thrown into the lake of fire. And he's with the beast. The beast is the Antichrist and the false prophet is the false systems of religion, including apostate Christianity. Okay. So now let's go to verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and he who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead and were, that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so <clears throat> this great white throne uh, is the throne of God, it's white because of its purity. And uh, it's great because of the, of God's authority. And uh, people will be judged according to their works. Now salvation is by grace to faith, but the rewarding will be according to one's works. Uh, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, but works are the evidence of faith. James says, you say you have faith, great, but show me the evidence. When we lived in Kansas, our next door neighbor was Missouri, the state of Missouri. And by the way, Kansas City, half of it is in Missouri, half of it is in Kansas. There's the Missouri River that runs through the middle of Kansas City, divides the city into two sections, and the state line runs right through the middle of the river. It's interesting, yeah. Well, on one side of the river is Kansas, the other side of the river is Missouri. And you know what the logo of the state of Missouri is? The show me state. Their license, the license plates you see on, on the back of vehicles, it says Missouri, the show me state. So in other words, they want evidence. You want me to believe, show me the evidence. And God says, you believe, in me, fine, show me the evidence. The evidence is obedience and good works. We do good works, we obey God, not to be saved, but because we're saved. That, that makes a difference. And the sea gave up the dead. You know, the sea gave up the dead, meaning those 
who die and their bodies were left unburied uh, will come to light and will come to life and then death and Hades will disappear. Uh, there are three words associated with uh, hell and death in the Bible. The one is the Hebrew Sheol, S-H-E-L, S-H-E-O-L. Sheol in Hebrew means the abode of the dead. And it generally means the grave. The dead live in the grave. So Sheol means the grave. And Hades is the Greek equivalent of Sheol. So Hades and Sheol mean the same thing. Then the other word is Gehenna, which is used in, in the Hebrew Bible and in the Greek Bible. Gehenna was the, the valley of the Hinnom Valley. If you go to Jerusalem, you will find there are, there's a valley separating the Mount of Olives from Mount Moriah. Between Mount Moriah and the Mount of Olives is a valley called the Hinnom Valley. That was the place where the refuse of the city was thrown or got accumulated. All the garbage of the city was thrown into that valley and then burned. Dead animals were also thrown there and burned. So there was perpetual fire going on in the Valley of Hinnom because there was always refuse, there was always garbage, and it was always burning. So Gehenna became the symbol of hell, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, which means that a time will come when death will be no more, okay? And, uh, and everyone whose name is not recorded in the Book of Life will experience the second death, will be thrown into the lake of fire together with the devil and the false prophet and the Antichrist. So there are two pictures here. One, one, is, one is a picture of jubilation and happiness. Uh, and the other one is a grim picture of rebellion and destruction and death. And I hope that we will end up among the happy group, not among the condemned. I love Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in the final judgment, we will not be condemned. Because of our union with Christ, because our faith in Christ, we will not be condemned. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the judgment will be for the wicked. It's not for us. We will not be condemned because the records of our sin has been erased. Jesus canceled our debt when he died on the cross in our place. Um, the law that condemns us, he nailed it to the cross. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. So there will be no evidence to condemn us. Our sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ. They're washed away. And their, um, their record is erased. So there's, there'll be no record of our sins in the books of heaven. And that's why we will not be condemned. So we have nothing to fear. We don't fear the final judgment because we will be vindicated and not condemned. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Remember that verse. It's very comforting. Any questions for today? <laughs> I'm sure you may have, you will have many. <laughs> Bad Valley. You said your first. You said your Emil, uh, Emilian, uh, um, uh, the first one, um, uh, uh, You believe in amillennialism, but I then you said you pre millennialism. Uh, pre which one you believe? The first or the third? 
Well, I am a pre-millennialist. I, when I discussed millennialism, I said, I believe in one thing they say, which is the 1000 years are symbolic, not literal. I only agree with that mm. statement of uh, emilianism. Mm. So. Uh, but I don't believe in the rest of what they say. <laughs> uh, the rest of what they say doesn't make sense to me. It's not biblical. Uh, but the 1,000 years, there is enough biblical proof to show that the 1,000 years are symbolic in Revelation chapter 20. That's the only place they're mentioned. And they're symbolic, not literal. Uh, for the reasons I showed you, there is an addendum which uh, I emailed to Debbie. She will post it for you maybe tomorrow. It said what scripture reveals around about the 1000 years. It's half page. Look at it. Look at the supporting verses. So when it comes to the first system of theology, Emilianism, I only believe, agree with them on one thing, that the 1,000 years are symbolic, not literal. I don't agree with the rest. So of the three systems, Emilianism, post-millennialism, and premillennialism, I am a premillennialist. In that, I believe Christ will come at the end of the great tribulation. And that's when the millennial rule will start. I don't uh, believe that the millennial rule of Christ is now taking place in heaven as the first group, the emilianism uh, says. So did, did you get me RP? Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But but really, you man, when Jesus he said I give up my spirit, he didn't say I give up my soul. You said our souls it's in heaven. The soul, what's the soul? Is our emotion, will and uh, will and emotion, will and mind. That's the soul. The spirit is different. There is a spirit, soul, and body. We are also like three 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 in one. The the spirit and the soul and the body. But when we, we die, is the soul goes our emotion and will and mind or the spirit, that whatever the Holy Spirit, when he comes and mixes up with us? We are a trichotomy. Uh, in one of the benedictions, that yeah. we, but that when the Jesus Paul says, says may spirit, your I body, body, soul, and spirit hmm. be kept undefiled yeah. until yeah. the second coming of Christ. Yeah. The body, we know what the body is. We know the soul is the essence of, yeah. of who you are. It's the combination of your thoughts, emotions, and will. That's your soul. The spirit is the breath. Yes. The breath that you inhale or exhale. That's the spirit. On the cross, Jesus gave up the soul. The Greek says he gave up the soul. Or he said, to God in yes. uh, my father into your hands, I commit myself or my soul, not the spirit. So, mm -hmm. so we are a trichotomy consisting of a body, soul, and spirit. The body is earthen, temporary, and decomposes. The soul is immortal. The soul is the combination of your emotions, decisions, and will. And the spirit is the breath, the breath of life, the breath that you inhale and exhale. So the breath God uh, breathed into Adam. The, the way I explain, uh, I had a very interesting way one person explained. He said, take nails and take a couple of uh, board, cardboard, I mean, um, uh, wood. When you nail the wood, you can build a chair. When you take out the wood, I mean the nails out of the wood, there is no chair. So we have a body that God created from dust. Then he put breath. He breathed life into that body. Then we all look alike, more or less. We have two eyes, we have whatever. However, what, what makes Alice Alice and what makes uh, Artie Artie, that's your soul. 
So when we die, it's just taking a, a part of the wood and the uh, nails. I want so to, there is no chair. I want to build on on what my wife said. Look at the Bible, what the Bible says in Genesis. Mm -hmm. God formed man out of the dust of the earth, okay? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Mm -hmm. And man became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Man became a living soul. So when, when, when the soul departs from the body, man stops being a soul. <laughs> Uh, uh, in our words, uh, the trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit, is interrupted at death. But, but when he says God made us in our, his image, God made us in his image, is it his, his, he gave us a mind, he gave us a will, he gave us an emotion, is that makes us like yeah. God? When he, he, he we, God created us in his image. First of all, image, it, yeah. What's his it, it means we're not created in God's physical likeness. Uh, but we, we are created in God's moral likeness. We have, of all created beings, we have a moral sense. The animals don't have the, uh, morality. Humans have. So we are created in God's image in the sense that we have a moral character. We know we can distinguish between right and wrong. That concept is not found among animals, for example, about, in, among the other cre creatures created by God. Uh, and then we have intelligence. We have an inventive mind. We can create things. Mm. I shouldn't say we can create, we can invent things. God can create, mm. we can invent. Uh, so in that sense, we're like God. We have a moral character, we have an intelligent mind, we have an inventive mind, a mind that can invent things. Uh, and emotions, that God, does God have emotions? We have emotions. Emotion, yeah, but the animals also have emotions. What distinguishes us from animals is our moral character, our intelligence, our inventive mind. So in that sense, we're created in God's image. We're not created after God's physical likeness. Well, because we don't know what God looks like. Mm -hmm. When the Bible says God has a hand that's, or, or God walks, that's to help us understand mm -hmm. God's activities. But it doesn't mean that God has uh, a hand like ours and has feet like ours. Madhuri, I have a question. I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Okay. At the first resurrection, the dead in Christ will rise. Yes. And because it's at a point where it was the thousand. Okay. It's at the end of the thousand years or at the beginning of the at thousand the, At the beginning. At the beginning. You see. So if it's at no. the beginning of the thousand years, it's because the world has come to accept Christ as their Savior. So oh, everybody was a believer at that point? No, no. This is what the post millennialists believe that a day will come when the whole world will be Christianized and then Christ will come and start the millennial. That's called post millennialism. That's not right. When Christ comes, okay, uh, the, the dead in Christ will arise first and the, the millennial rule of Christ will start here on earth. And, uh, and so the first resurrection takes place at that time. The dead in Christ rise first when Christ returns. At Christ's second coming. Okay. Christ's second coming, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those who are alive at that point, and the ones who, who, the ones who are alive will be believers and a combination of believers and unbelievers, I'm assuming. What happens to them? Because they are not asleep or dead. Well, I, I want you to imagine in your because this will be unusual. This is a, a unique event. This will be a unique event, the like of which this world has never seen. 
Christ comes accompanied by all the heavenly angels and by the souls of all the Christian dead. Mm -hmm. So he comes with all that glory. Uh, the wicked who are alive will die from, from the radiance of his glory. They'll die. Okay. Uh, and they will remain unburied. Uh, their bodies would be eaten up by the vultures and the wild animals. Then we, the, the Christians who ha happen to be alive at Christ's coming, will meet Christ in, in the air, will be raptured, like we'll meet him in the air. But then when he uh, will be accompanying the angels and, and, the, uh, and the saved back to this earth. You know, it's, uh, we'll just... We will be raptured. The word rapture means uh, ex an, an experience of exhilaration. Okay. Be, our joy will be unprecedented, will be tremendous. <laughs> so that's really, that's the meaning of rapture, that we will be caught okay. up to meet the Lord in the air, like to welcome him. All right. I, I, since at that point when Christ comes because of his glory, the unbelievers will die just from his presence or the glory. Does that include the fallen angels that had followed Satan? Uh, no, the, the angels, the, the, the fallen angels are reserved for judgment until okay. so well, then, the righteous will judge the fallen angels. They'll end up in the, in the lake of fire where they'll be tormented but right. they will not die at Christ at the appearance of Christ when he comes. Then at that point, is it only Satan who's going to be restrained and chained or the fallen angels that are still li living at that time? Well, okay. it looks, if, if the devil is restrained, his angels will be restrained too. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure all this out. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it, it, but the, 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 the ones, the people, the ones who uh, vulture ate them. But the Lord's, uh, the Lord's day, all the unbelievers, their tombs is going to be, all the unbelievers, their tombs is going to be open. They're going to be in front of the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to be judged. Yeah, what if those, that person... will be the wicked, those will be the wicked who died as unbelievers from the time of Adam yeah. until Christ's second they coming. Yeah. They'll be, the they'll be resurrected in this they will rise to life in the second resurrection which is called the yes. resurrection of damnation but for the for the to judgment be judged, to be judged yes. and, and thrown into in other words they'll be thrown into lake fire with their physical bodies yeah not physical glorified physical body, but uh, it's for the for the, the for the hell. But it's the body no. that is not gonna die. It's a body that's like we have glorified. Uh, only the saved will have glorified bodies. The wicked will have physical bodies. They want. They have a body that. Is gonna burn. They burn and burn and burn and they're not gonna die. That's a, that's a body that also eternal body. It's not yeah. gonna die. Yeah, also, it's because not a body like that. It's gonna burn and finish. This proves that annihilation, the concept of annihilation, mm. is wrong. There are some Christians who believe that uh, the wicked will be destroyed. Yeah, no. Yeah. Will be will suffer according mm. to their deeds, but eventually they'll be reduced to ashes. They won't be tormented forever and ever. Mm. Uh, this concept is called annihilation. Uh, they're, they're against annihilation. Or, or in other words, oh, you get annihilated. Eventually, if you are wicked, you get annihilated. This annihilation theory uh, is not right. Revelation chapter 20 does not support it. Because the, the wicked will be thrown into the lake of fire. They will be tormented forever and ever. If the reward of the righteous is eternal life, the punishment of the wicked will be the opposite. Eternal torment. That's, that means they have a body. It's a, like we yeah. have glorified body. We're not going to die. They have a body. They are not going to die in yeah. hell. Also. That's why yeah. there are two resurrections. The first one is in the first resurrection, the righteous rise. Yeah. 
the believers. Yeah. The, the second mm -hmm. resurrection, the wicked are raised. They are given yeah. resurrection bodies, not glorified bodies, but they're given yeah. resurrection. resurrection. They yeah. are judged and then thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah, resurrection bodies. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, uh, I had a long day, so I'm going to have to yeah. good night. And thank you again, Badwili. And for the ladies, I hope to see you all Saturday at 10 o'clock for our monthly women's Bible study on Zoom. Okay, yes. Good night. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have a good night. Good night. Badwili. 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 I have a question. Yes. Uh, Suzy went. Uh, okay, you say the tongues, we understand the tongues, but why if we understand tongues as languages, why we need an interpreter? Because even Paul said, when if there is, we, you speak in tongues, there should be a, a people or gift of interpretation. Why, why did he say that? If it's a language, uh, then uh, it's a language, the person who knows it. Why he says you need an interpreter? Well, the Apostle Paul tried to put an end to that, to that practice of speaking in tongues, and he, he did it in two steps. The first step was to restrict it, saying, mm -hmm. if you want to speak in tongues, you can do so if there is an interpreter. If mm -hmm. there's no interpreter, you can't speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the first step to restrict it, and the second one was to do away with it when he said, it's better to speak five words and be understood than speak... 5,000 words, 10,000 words, and not be understood. And if there is no interpreter. Oh, but there is the language of the angel. But he said, if you speak the tongues of angels, language, what was the language of angels? Uh, there is, that doesn't mean, that verse doesn't mean that the angels have, the angels may have a language, but we don't know what it is. But in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when the mm -hmm. Apostle Paul says, even if, even if I speak in the language of angels, but have no love, I'm yeah. not. So uh, he's not saying that we can speak in the language of angels. Mm. He's saying, even, even if I could speak in the language of angels, but have, he's trying to show the supremacy of love. That's his, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the aim of the Apostle Paul is to show that love is superior to everything. Yeah. And another thing, if God, if God knows Satan is a deceiver, he is deceiving us. Why is he allowing to, to come out of the, the abyss again? He is a deceiver. He knows, and we are uh, gullible. We we just uh, we get deceived. Even if God deceived, why he is allowing the deceiver to deceive the people? I don't understand. Well, that. he's not allowing them. To, he's not allowing uh, the devil to deceive people. But he what is he's saying, he's, what what we read in Revelation twenty is that a time will come when God will remove the restrictions he had placed on the devil, okay? He, he will start roaming around the world the way he does now. The restriction will be removed. But then he goes yeah. to people whom he had deceived in the first place. Uh, the, the, yeah. the wicked will rise in the second resurrection. He deceives them once again, and they follow him. Uh, and then they are punished. They follow him in trying to attack the camp of the saints and capture the headquarters of God, the beloved city of Jerusalem, and then fire comes from him and devours them. So this means that there is no second chance. There are some people who are saying there will be a second chance when the wicked rise in the second resurrection, they'll realize they've been deceived and they'll repent and accept Christ. That's not taught in Revelation chapter 20. That's not there. That's saying something which is not in the Bible. The Bible negates the concept of second chance. There is no second chance. The, those whom the devil had deceived and died unbelievers, when they rise up in the second resurrection, they'll be deceived again. <laughs> uh, none of them will be saved, unfortunately. When it says in the sea, the dead in the sea, who are those people, the dead in the sea? Are yeah, the people who drowned, people who drowned and were not buried in, in the earth, they're in, okay. at the bottom of the sea. 
but, but but really if like if now we if people are now it's so expensive the burial and burial ground if you decide to